So the urinary system is going to be the kidneys, um, the formation of urine, the transport to the bladder, the bladder, and what are the components of the urine. So it's the full urinary system. We're going to talk about renal anatomy and hopefully get through nephron physiology today. So that way, part three will be covered on Monday when we can look at the components of urine as well as um, do some urinalysis on our own urine. So as far as the kidney goes, or the urinary system, we have two kidneys usually, two ureters, bladder and urethra. They're, the kidney is actually one of the more common places that there can be variations from person to person. The, the job of the kidneys, obviously we know, is to filter, but it's really regulating plasma volume. If we have a lot of volume, we're retaining water, or if we have too much volume and we need to let water go out. And how we regulate volume, this will be the theme as we go through the whole kidney um, urinary system, is really sodium. We move sodium to move water. So that's really one thing we'll be learning about as we go along. Electrolyte concentration, so sodium is one of the electrolytes, but other electrolytes are like chloride and potassium and magnesium. So there's a lot of other electrolytes out there that's really, really important. Sodium just gets the most play, so to speak, and that we're most aware of. pH levels, when we get into the section after we talk about urine, we're gonna talk about fluid and pH. The kidney is our long-term regulator of our blood pH levels variations in pH. That's one of the functions of the kidney. Um, obviously, we, most people are familiar with filtering, so it's a waste removal and detoxification, similar to the liver, but doing different things. So it's a way to clear out various waste. The liver does it through bile, and then that goes out the feces. The kidney does it through the urine, and obviously it goes out that different way. Urethropoiesis, who can remember what that term means? Excellent, red blood cell formation. So kidney, weird, is in charge of forming red blood cells. So it is the place that the sensor is that we have low oxygen, like if we've gone up to altitude. It's in the kidney that the sensor actually indicates that our oxygen levels are low and it's gonna send out a hormone to our bone marrow so we make more red blood cells. So that's where another thing that the kidneys do, as well as um, we talked about jumping back up to the top, the renin, Remember, we had the baroreceptors for renin, and so we're going to go through, again, the renin and angiotensin system like we did um, sort of a recap from we did in Unit 2. So just the basic wherewithal as far as the kidney goes. It sits in, so we're looking at somewhere between T12 and L3 is where it's going to sit. So the top of the kidney is actually going to rest and be protected by the ribs. Um, it's known to be retroperitoneal, so it's hidden behind the parietal peritoneum. Remember, that's the bubble that contains the gut. So it's actually behind that. So if our guts were to rupture and blow up, the bacteria that would come out of there is not going to be affecting the kidney because it's in its own sealed chamber in the back wall. Um, we are going to pull the cadaver out and have a look at that. I don't know if we'll have time today or if we'll just do that on the urinalysis day when we're doing more lab stuff. Um, so then the adrenal gland, it is not on any of the kidneys I have in here, but the adrenal gland is really just a fatty blob that's gonna sit on top of the kidney itself. And actually when we dissect it in the cadaver, it's hard to discern it from regular connective tissue around it because it just has more of an unorganized appearance to it. So the hilum, just like in the lungs, is the place where our arteries and veins, and in this case the ureter, is gonna come in and out. So that's gonna be the hilum. Um, we have the renal artery going in, the renal veins, we have nerves, and obviously the ureter is coming out from that point. This picture here, we can see that um, the retroperitoneal nature of the kidney, so see how it's behind, actually shows the pancreas here in front of it. Um, we see that it's actually in its own sort of fat-filled, kind of packed in there capsule, so it's quite protected. Okay, so what we need to know about the anatomy of the kidney. So I'll just draw this on the board. So if we have our kidney, kind of kidney shaped, we have these, the cortex, which is gonna be on the outside, remember? And then we have these weird little pyramid things, which are handily called renal pyramids. 
So that makes something a little easier for once. So the cortex is going to be out above here. So this area is going to be the cortex. And then if you were to do a dotted line and just encompass the portion that these little triangles are in, that's going to be the medulla. And so the within the medulla are going to be these renal pyramids. The tip of the renal pyramid are known as papilla sort of like papillary muscles. If you recall, they kind of come to a little tip. It actually means nipple in some, some language. Um, renal columns are going to be the spaces in between. So these are pyramids. And these are columns. And then this whole middle part, I'm gonna do a dotted line will be the medulla. Then what we have are the drainage systems. That's going to be the calyces. There's a minor calyx, that's singular, calyces is plural. So with that sort of big picture just saying, hey, the kidney is taking a bunch of blood, filtering out the bad, and letting whatever is bad drip out into the urine. So where it's coming out is the bottom of the pyramid, at the renal papilla, and you have a minor calyx. So the minor calyx is going to be like a little catch basin for the urine that's dripping out the papilla. So really, this whole cortex to papilla, there's a network, a filtering network. And essentially, you have urine that's going to be dripping out. So the urine is kind of filtering this way. So it's literally dripping out of each of these pyramids off the papilla. So the catch basin is going to be the minor calyx for each one. Each one has its own minor calyx and you can see where two come together. It's a major calyx. So in this view we have a minor calyx, a minor calyx, and a minor where this would be a major calyx. That's all just sort of gets bigger as it's gathering more and more. So each individual pyramid would have its own minor calyx that the urine is dripping into. And then it goes into this wider basin, which is the top of the funnel, that being the renal pelvis. And so that's kind of as we gather some of these guys up. This would be renal pelvis. You'll see also the term renal sinus. Now we know sinus is in our head and there's spaces. So really the renal sinus is if we were to pull this out is the space in the kidney that the pelvis sits in. It seems a bit redundant, but the actual location that the urine is in is the renal pelvis. So that this renal sinus is just the space of the kidney that's been hollowed out for the pelvis to exist within. So I don't know, it's a fine line there. So once you leave the renal pelvis or once the urine leaves, then we're in full on ureter. And then it's heading down to the bladder from that point. So here's our basic anatomy of where the physiology is taking place up in the cortex and the medulla and then we drip urine into the minor calyx, major calyx, renal pelvis, and then out the ureter to the bladder to leave the body. We can see from here, we're gonna go through a number of vessels as well. I think I have this as a recap. So the blue arrow indicates what region of the kidney? Yep, and the green, the medulla, and specifically what part of the medulla? The pyramid, excellent. Okay, so then between the pyramids is the columns, and then at the bottom of each pyramid, it's called the papilla, and each papilla drains into the minor calyx, and then the major calyx, okay. So renal vasculature. So this here, I think, is less effective at learning. It's more just a list form, so we can know a list of vessels that we're gonna go through. So I'll draw another kidney over here. That way it doesn't get too messy with this. Um, I'll draw another kidney here. Okay. So if we have our pyramids, and I win no prizes for our work. 
and this is our ureter coming out there. Pretty sad kidney and a sad ureter. So if we have our aorta coming down, we're going to have the renal artery coming into the kidney, right? The renal artery is going to then divide into the segmental and interlobar artery. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it, usually a couple segmentals. Let me go back and we can actually see here. So you can see where there's can be variations in how it branches off. Um, generally, this part is known as a segmental, where interlobar is going to be these as these separate out. But sometimes, depends on how many pyramids are in an indicative an area, that could be its own interlobar. So there's a lot of variations. But basically, we have a few segmentals kind of coming out. And then we'll say a segmental. And then we have coming up into these columns are going to be the interlobar. Remember, we always put the lowercase a to indicate it's an artery. So an interlobar artery is going to be between each of the pyramids. And then we have one known as the arcuate. So I always like to remember that one because it's arcing around. And it actually is connecting the interlobars by going above. I sort of over-exaggerated it in this drawing. It's a little tighter to the top of the pyramid but it's just arcing about above the top of the renal pyramids. So this would be the arcuate artery. So we have an arcuate artery there and there, and these interlobars are coming in between. Then we have what looks like interlobar again, but this is interlobe ular. So I always think of the U as up, and that's out in the cortex. So interlobe ular, radiate out here into the cortex. They are also known sometimes as cortical, which makes a little more sense because they're in the cortex, but they're the same thing. So if you see that in a book or text, it's not an extra one. They're just sort of wave waffling between the vessels. So here, I'm just gonna draw a little arrow, is interlobe, I'm gonna put a U and underline it, because it's different, it's different than the low bar. So it's interlobular artery. Then we're gonna go into this whole nephron because now we're divided down so small that the next branch off, it kind of looks like a Christmas tree. Um, the interlobulars go off to this afferent arterial and the afferent arterials really just branch off these interlobular arteries. And they literally feed into every single one of a glomerulus, which we'll get into that, a glomerulus is the start of our filtering system. So if you can remember when we did muscle physiology, or you did muscle physiology in 201, we talked about a whole muscle and you broke it down and said, oh, how a muscle contracts is Z line to Z line, a single sarcomere. And you have a single sarcomere, but then that's repeated over and over again, a thousand times down the length of a muscle. So if you learn about one sarcomere, then you kind of know what's going on in the whole muscle. We're going to learn about one nephron. That's one filtering unit, but that's what's repeated hundreds of thousands of times to a single kidney. So the afferent arterial goes to the glomerulus, which is the head of one filtering unit. So that's where, so you can see, this little Christmas tree sort of formation or stick Christmas tree, it's a start. So we're going to then kind of ignore the microscopic components of the filtering system at this point to just to go back so we can do the vein side. And the vein side really just matches the artery side coming back. So we have an interlobe, interlobar vein coming back. We have the arcuate vein. We have an interlobar vein but we rarely have a segmental or um, low bar. It just sort of actually probably more of a segmental and then it'll come together. They all coalesce more easily They're, um, on the venous side to become the renal vein, which is gonna go into the inferior vena cava and back to the heart. So on the gross anatomy of the kidney, 
you should be able to answer questions either from a diagram, name these vessels, or be able to, if I were to say, name the vessel, name the artery between the renal pyramids, name the artery that's between the medulla and the cortex. So you're saying arcuate. Between the pyramids is going to be interlobar. Name the main artery that afferent arterials branch off of. Let's look at the Christmas tree. So then we're looking at interlobular. So most of the questions will be of a descriptive nature, but if you were to see a kidney diagram, first and foremost, you should know this type of anatomy. This was a really cool picture of a casted um, kidney. Anyways, he's done it here. These are cool arteries. You can really see the extensive network. You can see the renal artery, the lobar, the segmental, and, but you can see rather than our just 2D plane, how the kidney, this is all radiating out more of I've seen a 3D fashion. Here they've dyed it, tried to go veins versus arteries. They just did one over there, so kind of there's a nicer artery here, this bottom one. And then this one, they also injected the ureter as well in yellow. So you can see that where we can see how the, up here it looks like weird little flower petals for obviously a weird descriptor of our calyces, but that's what calyces are these little funnels where the urine will drip into. So you can see kind of that embedded up in here and then the renal sinus and the ureter coming out. You can see a little nicer over here. So that is something out of Brazil. So here's the vessels. I can't remember if I have it animated or not, but we'll go through number one is renal artery, two, segmental, three, interlobar, four, arcuate, five, interlobular, because that's the up one. Yep. So that's it. So now that we have sort of the lay of the land, although really messy how I wrote it here, this here is where I really need you to transform your mind and visualize it that we're going to look at a single filtering unit, which is named called the nephron. So a single nephron involves, let me get a, oh, I'm not fresh out of yardsticks or pointers. All right, so how do we use this pen? So you can see where you have, it looks like weird little lips, but X actually the afferent arterial. So this little Christmas tree thing I drew, a single little branch off to the side would limit, limit one of those little lines going in. So it's like bringing blood into this little bubble. Each one that starts with this little round bubble, that's the start of one filtering unit. So this picture shows you two filtering units. One's just shifted a little higher than the other. So what we have here, and I'll do it on this drawing, is where we're going to have an afferent arterial. I guess I'll do this in red. So remember we have our interlobular artery coming off and we have, we'll just do one single afferent arterial coming off of that. I'm gonna make a little dot. That red dot I have here is mimicking this purple dot up there with the little red line coming in. So one of the red lines is this afferent arterial that we've drawn here. So how this goes is you end up with a little capsule around it. We're gonna go through the details of the capsule. You have a wiggly section of tubing that then ultimately dips down into this pyramid. Sometimes they start real high and it only dips a little into the pyramid. Sometimes they start really low and it dips further down, but the Basically, the blood going into it and the round little bubble head and the wiggly tubes are all going to be in the cortex. There's just a U portion that's going to dip down into the medulla. So this is obviously really messy. I mean, we're going to ultimately draw this a lot bigger over here. Um, but I wanted you to see it in place, in position with the gross anatomy of the kidney. So this picture on this side is nicer where we can see our arcuate artery here between our renal pyramid and our cortex, the interlobar artery going off, and each one, again, looks like a Christmas tree with these little balls hanging off, are that each one of those is an afferent arterial going to a glomerulus, glomerulus. that's each little ball. Again, we'll do that. And then they expand out to that. 
So this is just to sort of set your mind down as we do our microscopic vision and conceptualization. So now we're gonna go into the physiology of a single nephron and how this works and what's going on with the filtering. Each section is gonna have its own job. So we have this, here's a repeat, the nephron location, it crosses from the cortex and goes down into the medulla. Each of these parts are gonna have their own name and their own job. But what we can see in this line here, being an interlobular artery and a single afferent arterial going into, we're gonna do the upper one, filters and we have wiggle, down into the medulla, up, wiggle, and then ultimately, I'm gonna put this in a different color. What comes down in this green one is known as a collecting duct. That's gonna be the end. That's after the final waste is accumulated. And you can see at this bottom portion here, that is the renal papilla. So the collecting duct is just taking the urine down all the way down until it just drips out there at the bottom of the pill. So that's kind of where we want to see what, where this is going. So the parts of a single nephron, so that's one filtering unit, is that we're going to have tubules. That's the stuff that the urine's collecting in. So let's kind of think of the tubules as the waste drainage system, like the piping. The vasculature, that's the blood. So we're bringing blood into it. The blood has waste in it. We want the waste to end up in the tubules. So the, and so that the end of the blood pathway should be clean, right? Because all the waste has left it. So we have these tubules and we have the blood. And then last, we have this crazy thing known as the juxtaglomerular apparatus. And that's gonna be our like $100 word for the day that we'll get to at the end. But the most important part now is really being comfortable with the tubules and the vasculature and how they form a nephron. The juxtaglomerular apparatus is just fine tuning what's going on. So a kidney, this might be one of your slip slides. Okay, so the kidney is obviously the nephron is one functional unit, one filtering unit of the kidney. So how we do this, how the kidney really works is opposite to the liver. You guys remember from the liver, we had blood that would enter into the liver and waste would go out and the bile would take it away. So it was really just pulling waste down. The kidney is like, no, I'm not going to pick through and pull out waste. The kidney is like, give it all to me and I'll send back the good stuff. So it's sort of, instead of the liver picking out the bad, the kidney's like, I'll take it all and I'll send back the good. Does that make sense? It's kind of the opposite. So what's happening is this initial filtration up here is the blood shows up at this bulbous head glomerulus that I keep referring to that we're going to get into more detail in a moment. But it's at this round bulbous glomerulus that is a capillary bed inside. And what's happening is anything that's really small, most of the fluid is going to come out of the blood and into the tubule. And then it's the job of the rest of the tubules to send back good things like water and glucose and things that our body really needs to have. So this initial filtration is separation of the water and a lot of the dissolved solutes, some of which is waste, most of which is actually good stuff. So it's taking away good and the bad at this initial filtration. And then the idea of selective reabsorption, the reabsorption concept means it's going from the filtrate, which is think of the, like the piping, the plumbing that's carrying the waste. Selective reabsorption is sending the good back to the blood. That's reabsorbing. So we are reabsorbing our water. We're going to reabsorb our glucose. We're going to reabsorb some of our fatty acids and our amino acids. So reabsorption is bringing the good back into the blood so that we don't see it up. So that's a really, really important job. So that way, whatever's left over in the pipes of the tubules is really just the waste. So in the end, we have the whole distance of the nephron 
whether we're doing the wiggle or the down or the end wiggle, all it is is a series of tubes that allow us to bring all the good stuff back and leave the waste inside the tubules. Now, the idea of secretion means something that didn't originally get filtered out. It might be bigger and chunkier, so it missed the initial filtration. It actually gets pulled from the blood and then thrown <coughs> into the filtrate. So it's not everything was just initially filtrated. So those are three concepts that we're going to keep track of. Filtration, reabsorption, and secretion are three main things that's going to be the hallmark of what's happening in three main regions throughout the nephron. This here, this slide, just shows the anatomy terms of the tube part. This is the plumbing that's holding the waste. So the tubule starts from the Bowman's capsule where we initially pull out all the good and bad, all the, we do the filtration to take place there, and then all the tubules beyond that that's going to help send back the good. The vasculature that's in blue in this slide is really the names of the blood vessels that go along. So you really want to think of the tubes as plumbing and the vessels, they're going to run side by side to each other. Because initially, all the good went into the tubule. And then as the vessels running next to the tubules, the good is coming back to the blood during the whole. So they just want to think of them as running in parallel to each other. Okay, so we're going to start from our interlobular artery. We had our arcuate down here. Yeah. We will. Um, from the interlobular artery, draw this one line. It's going to go here into the afferent arterial. The afferent arterial is going to go into this squiggly thing I'm drawing here. This is known as the glomerulus. I'm just going to go back on the slide real quick so you can see that we're following this side. I'm just going to kind of go through the vessels and then we're going to draw in the tubules as well. So the AFA, and hopefully it's got this just good here. So we have our afferent arterial and the glomerulus. So this is really blood that we are going to say has loads of waste in it. You know, it's going to the kidney. It's got a lot of waste inside the blood that we want out. Goes into the glomerulus. It is at the point of the glomerulus that we have the waste separated from the blood. Do you remember the term for that? Filtration. And then leaving the glomerulus, we have the efferent arterial. So these are our blood components. We have afferent arterial with lots of blood, a lot, lot of waste in it, going to the glomerulus. The glomerulus is the capillary bed of the kidney. So at a level of the capillary, it's only one cell thick. One cell thick area is where you're going to have the ability to allow things to go through, obviously to ooze out of the kidney. So it's here that, I'm going to draw this little, this capsule thing that goes around it in blue is going to be known as the Bowman's capsule. So at this point that the blood from the afferent arterial comes into the glomerulus, it's got loads of waste. And now the blood and the waste is getting pulled out of the blood, crossing the little capillaries that's all within here. So the waste gets pulled in here and it starts to go this way, like it's being pulled from the level of the Bowman's capsule out of the glomerulus, that's the blood. And so it's gonna have lots of water and lots of the waste, glucose, fatty acids, it's going to have lots of good stuff. So this has loads of stuff that good and bad that came into the kidney, into the single glomerulus from the afferent arterial. So what would you think is in the afferent arterial? Is there going to be a lot of blood in the afferent arterial? Is it going to be waste of blood? Is it what, 
what would you speculate is the, the component of the eastern arterial? So I like to think of the eastern arterial. I like to, so this is obviously an exaggeration, but it's meant for more conceptualization. You've got normal blood coming in, atrial arterial filled with waste and so on. The waste and the fluid filtration is what's taking place here. This is known as filtration. So what's in the atrial arterial, I like to think of as sludge blood, because what didn't escape? Hormones, red blood cells, giant chunky things that didn't make it through the one capillary layer of the glomerulus. So it was like we sucked out all the liquid that had the good and bad dissolved in it and we left the big chunky stuff. So again, conceptually, think of the efferent arterial as sludge blood. And we need to get our water and our good stuff back into it right away so that we can have a normal blood again, just without the waste. So we pulled this out. Does that make sense at least what filtration is and what's taking place? So we bring blood in into the glomerulus is the capillary bed, but the Bowman's capsule is the start of the tubules or the piping, sewer pipe, if you want to think of it. Efferent arterial is going to be basically clean blood because it doesn't have the waste all sucked out of it, except for the large chunks that we'll learn about later. But the whole point from now on, as we continue on with this nephron and naming this heart, is we're going to focus on reabsorption, which is sending the good stuff back into the blood. We don't have sludge blood anymore, but we've left the waste behind in here. So as we continue on, we have the efferent arterial, and the efferent arterial will turn into, and I'm not going to draw it very well because it ends up being really messy, but we're going to call them the peritubular capillaries. So peri means around, around the tubules. So it's a capillary bed that's going to be around all of the tubules here. It's going to just go all around it. It's going to look like some sort of weird, you know, crocheted back dance thing. Like it's just kind of wrapping all around it because around every section of the tubule, we're going to have water and the good stuff going back into the blood. So you have to have the capillary, which is what the blood's going to be, around it. So instead of drawing as like squiggle marks of it around, I'm just going to kind of let it go as we continue with the naming the tubule side of it. So because the start of the tubules, this is the blue, the first section of tubing is known as the proximal, because it's closest to here, that's proximal, convoluted, because it's going to be wavy, it's convoluted, and it's a tubule. So that's happening from, say, from here to here. So this sort of distance, this is the proximal convoluted tubule. And you can see that in this picture as it's wiggly and it ends here, because this next U-turn one is going to be called something else. So during the proximal convoluted tubule, we have, I draw the eastern arterial a little bit better, kind of cruises around, and let me just draw the peritubular capillaries so they're following next to the tubule. Again, looking for a real messy drawing, even in my, especially with my horrible drawing. So you remember we have waste here, but we also have good stuff in there. Ahead. And so during the whole distance that this proximal convoluted tubule is next to these, the blood component, I'm going to put here in this maroon marker all the good stuff that's going to get reabsorbed. So this will be re. Reabsorption. So we'll just name it. 
good stuff. We'll say like water, glucose, good electrolytes, we'll say magnesium, that's a good thing. Um, vitamins, amino acids, other like good stuff. Back to the blood. We'll just say in parentheses, out of the tubules. Does that make sense? So reabsorption means first we had the Bowman's capsule where filtration took place. We sucked out good, bad, all the stuff dissolved in water. Re proximal convoluted tubule comes and right away we send the good stuff back into the blood so the blood can be normal again. So what's going to get left over and stay behind in the tubule? The not good stuff that would be waste. So the waste remains, but the good returns. So the blood becomes essentially more regular blood and less sludgy at this point. You with me on that? Oh, not. Okay. We'll go through this again. So we're just kind of trying to map out. So you're getting a lot of new terms and actions. I'm sort of throwing it, throwing all of you at the same time. So I should have probably just drawn it out and named everything first. Okay. Good. Um, so we filtrate, we reabsorb, and then we have this funky little new term, loop de loop. And because I wrote too much here, I'm gonna make our longer proximal convoluted tubule. And then we have loop de loop down and up. And we have down, but notice when I do the down and up, we're going to have a skinny side and a really thick side. So that's going to be important later too. So we have this, and this is known as the loop of Henley. You turn it. The job of the loop of Henley is primarily Reabsorption still. But pretty much focused on water. It's really just trying to extract as much extra water that didn't get reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. The loop of Henley's job is to just pull out even more water molecules so we're not just wasting it and keying too much water out. So the loop of Henley, the way it goes down and up is a way for us to hyper-concentrate sodium, which we'll get to later, but that's its job, water reabsorption. Proximal convoluted tubules, pretty much everything good reabsorption, including water, but this one's pretty focused on water. And then we have another wiggly one at the end. All right, I'm And what do you think this guy's called? If it's wiggly and it's at the end, it's going to be convoluted. And if this one's proximal, then this one will be distal. Yeah. So we've got the distal convoluted tubule. And it does some reabsorption, but really its main job, because we've had so much tubular components dedicated to reabsorption. What's really the thing of note here, so there's going to be two things of note that we're going to go through, but the first one will be known as secretions. And what that means, so I'm going to follow these peritubular capillaries. I'm just going to skip over the loop of Henley here. So if we're still in the peritubular capillaries, we have the tube here and the blood here. What secretion is, is any 
say larger waist chunks they were too big to get filters over here they didn't really make it out the tiny little gaps and through the single layer of the capillary beds so they're larger molecules but they're still waste and so we grab onto them and we pump them into the tubule so i want you to realize that reabsorption and secretion are opposite directions of each other reabsorption so this is an important concept reabsorption is moving things from the tubule to the blood Secretion is moving waste from the blood to the tubule. So one is out of the blood, reabsorption is into the blood. So those terms are specific because of their direction. So once we've got secretion added in, we have the waste that stayed in, but we pulled out all the water, we have big waste chunks. We've got all the little waste chunks that we got out when we filtered. And now the kidney, the nephron is done with its job. The nephron's like, okay, I did as good as I could do. And here we go. I'm dumping it into this thing known as the collecting duct. And I'm dumping all the waste here and that's where it's going to be urine and that's going to be now you're not modifying it too much from that point on. There is some modification. But for our purposes, we're sort of done talking about it. The collecting duct will also be receiving from distal convoluted tubules from other nephrons. So it's actually collecting from several other nephrons of waste from like a nephron that started over there. So it's gonna have lots of entry points. And so it's collecting from many dropping down, and that's the collecting duct that's going to come to the bottom of those renal pyramids, the papilla, and the bottom of these little collecting ducts are going to go drip, drip, drip out a bunch of urine. Okay. So I'm going to erase this. And we're going to start it all over again, more slowly. Or do you want to take a picture? So we'll start it all over and just kind of let you realize I want you to think of it the physiology for the physiology I want you to think of three things that the nephron does filtration reabsorption and secretion okay we first separate everything that it can get in here it's just like give it all to me that's filtration Reabsorption says, hey, there's a bunch of good stuff. We don't want to pee out, so let's send it back to the blood. The kid, the Lupa Henley says, let's work hard to get extra water to retain back into the body. And the distal convoluted tubule says, hey, there's a couple things I missed at the glomerulus, so let's secrete it and bring in extra waste that didn't get initially filtered so it can make it out into the urine as waste. So those are the three physiology concepts. Hannah. So this, I'll do it backwards. So this here is a another nephron. So there's like another interlobular artery afferent arterial, glomerulus, Bowman's capsule. That nephron has its own proximal convoluted tubule, Lupa Henle, distal convoluted tubule. So the point here is the single collecting duct is collecting from several other nephrons. And you can see that here in this picture where it's just saying it's coming from other, you can see other, you know, spouts coming in. I'm gonna go back a little bit here. So I want you to notice at the start where we had our arcuate artery and our interlobular artery and see from the interlobular there are several afferent arterioles. So they would be coming off, and that's what those little red dots are. Are you with me on that left side of the picture where it has that with the little red dots? It looks like kind of a Dr. Seuss Christmas tree. And so then 
each one of those, I'm just going to draw it in a smaller, is going to have its own Bowman's capsule, its own loop, a Henle, and so on. You have these. So you can see how there's like nephrons all over the place. And just like a single interlobular artery is supplying blood, there's also single collecting ducts that's receiving the urine and the waste from them. So things get messy real fast. Let me talk about the kidney. But, but that's what that, did that answer your question? Any other questions before I erase it and we kind of recap this again? Okay, so we did filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. Who can tell me what secretion means? What secretion? From blood to the tubules, yeah, so that's secretion. So what would be tubule to the blood? Reabsorption. And what is filtration? When we separate it in the first place, we just took everything that was small and liquefied out of the blood. Good, bad, just everything. Whole kit and caboodle. And then the efferent arterial just has the sludge blood leaving. And then immediately the efferent arterial turns into peritubular capillaries and reabsorption brings back the water and a lot of other good things. So our blood will normalize. See, so the filtration happens at the renal corpuscle. I didn't tell you about the renal corpuscle yet. The renal corpuscle is the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. So the renal corpuscle is both of those together. Reabsorption, we're going to go through that. We're going to talk about the renal threshold. We'll talk a little bit about countercurrent multiplication. So tell me the two main locations along the nephron that reabsorption will take place. Yep, the squiggly. So it's going to wear the proximal convoluted tubule. And we have more of reabsorption specific for water in the loop of Henle. Okay. Secretion is going to take place in the where? Distal convoluted tubule. So we have an afferent arterial coming in. We have, it's just a little network in here, so that's the glomerulus, and the efferent arterial leaving. The Bowman's capsule is around it here. So we have, let me draw this here, glomerulus and Bowman's capsule. And the two together is the renal corpuscle. Okay. So in the Bowman's capsule, that's the tubule part, the first part of the tubule, it's going to be way up in the renal cortex, so it's going to be up high in the kidney. Um, it's going to be wrapping around the glomerulus, so you can see that, cupping it around. Um, it brings the filtrate. So the term filtrate is the stuff we extracted or pulled out of the blood. So it brings the filtrate into the proximal convoluted tubule. So it's sort of bringing it out of the blood. It's now called filtrate, the stuff that got separated out of blood. And now it's going to send it on into the proximal convoluted tubule, which will be into there. What it's doing is it says this is what comes out. Water, small solutes, nutrients, all the stuff I had on the good list to come back. But also, I didn't put on here with the most important, waste. So there's going to be waste in there too. So all that's going to come out at the filtrate as well. So this is where I'm saying this is the good and the bad all together. 
The next slide is just talking about the glomerulus on the inside of there. The glomerulus is the blood part of it. This is the same thing. It's where it's inside the Bowman's capsule. It has special fenestrated capillaries, you know, those special capillaries. We have the continuous in our normal um, capillary beds. This is where we actually have hydrostatic pressure, osmotic gradients that's actually forcing the water out. It is the point of this glomerulus, because it's still the blood, why we need to maintain high blood pressure. And I don't mean high blood pressure like in our current term, but our kidney will freak out if it has too low of pressure because it can't force this, it can't do its filtration. So that's why we have this whole renin angiotensin system that we have to deal with later, which is the number one driver of our high blood pressure problems out there in the world. So it's because the kidney is so quick on the trigger to raise our pressure if it feels like it's not getting enough pressure, driving pressure to do its job of filtration. So this is gonna come in a little bit later. Okay, so the renal corpuscle is both of them together. We have the glomerulus, the capillary component that I draw as a squiggle, and then the Bowman's capsule on the outside. Those are the two things that form the renal corpuscle. And then once the waste and all the stuff gets out here into this Bowman's capsule, it's gonna get head out, headed out and sent on into the proximal convoluted tubule. Giving a little more detail on filtration. It's just saying you really need hydrostatic pressure, osmotic gradient, just a way to push out this filtrate, how to get stuff out of the blood, that's all. I don't care that you know it's minus what the pressure is. Don't even worry about that. This is just explaining what filtration is, is separating it from the blood. This is actually what it looks like on a histological slide from, a course, from the cortex, and you actually see the glomerulus. We actually have proximal convoluted tubules here, and the one with the D is distal convoluted tubule. And the reason why I wanna point that out is, what do you notice? between, that's different, between the proximal and distal convoluted tubules. See, this one's the distal. And then just the, the proximals should be more fuzzy looking, where the distals are kind of cleaner looking inside. So that makes sense to some degree. The point I'm trying to make is because there's so much more filtrate at the proximal convoluted tubule, it's got microvilli and it has more surface area to do reabsorption. By the time we get to the distal convoluted tubule, there's not that much left in there. So we don't need the extra um, villi for sur surface area. So this is actually, a, I thought was a cool slide. You can actually see an interlobular artery coming in and we see little afferent arterioles as well as a single glomerulus and then the efferent arterial that's leaving it. So while we're still talking here about this glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule, you're gonna hear the term glomerular filtration rate, the GFR. That's a very common clinical term that you're gonna be exposed to and aware of. And so what GFR is, is really the performance of the kidney. Like the heart, cardiac output, remember for the heart, the heart's job is to pump. And cardiac output is how much can you pump in one minute? It's sort of like a stand, it's sort of like the car, our car drives. So the standard of its efficiency is miles per gallon. How many miles can you get going down the road in one gallon? And the heart is how much volume can you pump in one minute? The kidney's job is to filter. So the GFR is how much can you filter in one minute? So it is just a standard of performance for the kidney. So that's why if someone has some sort of kidney problems, their GFR or glomerular filtration rate is assessed to see how good it is at doing its filtering job. So we have this thing called creatine clearance is probably the most common way of doing it. There are newer ways of doing it. This is a very old slide. Um, and really you're just measuring how much is excreted per hour and you can do a bunch of math to figure out what's this 24 hour and these, these collections over a certain period of time. 
So essentially, I want you to just know that the glomerular filtration rate is the term for the performance of the kidney's job efficiency. This bottom part is just to point out that if you don't have enough hydrostatic pressure, that's driving pressure into the kidney, you can drop blood pressure by, if you drop blood pressure by only 20%, you can actually stop filtration of the kidney. So you can see the kidney might freak out if it's not getting enough pressure because it has to filter or you will die. And so the kidneys are very good at raising blood pressure and we'll talk about obviously that down the road when we talk about renin. But this was just a point just to say how important it is to have adequate pressure to your kidneys. Glomerular filtration rate is just the amount of filtrate in one minute, that's all. It's just a mark of performance, no different than miles per gallon in your car. How we control pressure coming in, just think of this in general. We have obviously auto regulation, we're just increasing pressure at the level. If it's not getting enough pressure, it's gonna open up the arterial to send more blood in. That's a local control. Hormonal regulation, if the kidney's not getting enough blood, we do the whole renin angiotensin system. That means it's sending out hormones to the body to cause massive vasoconstriction to drive more pressure out into the kidneys. And then sympathetic nervous system, when you're really stressed or under some sort of duress, your sympathetic autonomic control can actually drive more pressure into the kidneys. So you have either local opening closed in the vessel, you have hormones throughout the body that's going to drive more pressure, or you have your sympathetic nervous system that also drives pressure. So now we're going to go into the next step. Proximal convoluted tubule. The proximal convoluted tubule is our next part. Proximal convoluted tubule. What is the main job of the proximal convoluted tubule? Excellent. Reabsorption. What does reabsorption mean? From the tubule up to the blood. Yeah. So we'll draw the blood in here. So I have our peritubular capillary that's going to be here. So this would be our blood. Our peritubular capillary. So reabsorption of the good stuff, right? Water and all the good stuff is going to go back. And then we have simple cuboidal cells because there's a lot of pumping going on. So it's telling you what's reabsorbing. Those are all good things. So right here is our proximal convoluted tubule. More than 95% of our stuff gets reabsorbed. The rest is just icing on the cake. So the proximal convoluted tubule does the vast majority of all the work of reestablishing the blood. I wanted to put this back into place. So after we've done part of this already, I want you to still remember gross anatomy of the kidney. We have this as a single pyramid. Remember, this is the papilla here at the bottom and into the minor calyx. So we would have a glomerulus either high or low. You can have the proximal convoluted tubule, you have the lupa henleys down, but you can also see where the collecting ducts are coming down. So notice in the renal pyramids, we only have things that are of straight lines and all the wiggly things are up in the cortex. This is why, so again, this is a, a slide regarding reabsorption. And we are, I have, I mentioned sodium, but we're gonna talk about sodium a little bit later, more specifically about water, but just know where sodium goes, water follows. How we reabsorb the good back up to the blood, we use facilitated diffusion and there's passive diffusion. We're not gonna go into any more detail than that. Just means like glucose, it needs a carrier to make it through. So it's, that's all. It's sort of like a turnstile. It just can't go through the gate. It has to actually get locked in place and then something shifts it over. If you wanna think of it as simply as something like that. That's facilitated diffusion and then passive. So reabsorption just uses those two mechanisms. And we have active transport of sodium. Because we actively transport sodium, water will follow. We have no water pumps. 
So if we want water to go from point A to point B, we have a tubule and we have lots of water. And we want our water to go back into the blood. There's no pump that's gonna have, let that happen. But what we do have are little pumps for sodium. So any sodium that's in here, we can pump sodium into the blood. And when we pump sodium into the blood, water will follow. So it's really important for us to move sodium so that we can move water. So think of it like sodium, like a little carrot, and then the water will follow, kind of follow, think of it that way. So that's why we actively transport sodium, not so much that we want sodium, we just want water. So these are the components. So let's just say this is the good stuff. Remember we filtered even the good stuff out. Renal threshold. The concept of renal threshold is the threshold at which we don't reabsorb anymore, like we have enough. So an example is glucose. If we took out glucose, we'll make that in purple, it's the good stuff. So we have glucose but we want glucose to be reabsorbed back into the blood, right? But our renal threshold, meaning kind of the limit, is 180 milligrams per deciliter. If our renal threshold that we bring in here is the, to quantify it, is 180 milligrams per deciliter. If we have, for instance, somebody with diabetes, and say they have blood that has 200 milliliters, milli, milligrams, yeah, milligrams, milligrams per deciliter. That means we're gonna bring back 180, but crazy enough as it is, we're gonna leave some glucose in there, about 20, right? Because it really says the renal threshold is the limit of what we can reabsorb. That's the threshold Really what it means is what comes out in the urine, you pee it in a pee cup, and then you're like, oh, I have some glucose in here. Definitely exceeded that 180 milligrams per deciliter. So you just know the fact that there's even any glucose in your urine cup that you've exceeded your renal threshold. Amino acids, I put these as other examples, not so much I want you to memorize, I really want you to memorize the, the glucose one, because that's the most important. The other ones, I don't care about the number, but I want you to see that there's different numbers for different stuff. So for instance, amino acids, so you have like a huge turkey dinner, you know, Thanksgiving's coming out, this huge turkey dinner, loads of protein, you're gonna easily exceed 65 milligrams per deciliter in your blood that you've absorbed. And so that is gonna actually come out in your urine. You'll have a high protein level in your urine peeing out because the body's like, we need amino acids, but you know what? We got plenty. The rest, you can just stay in the filtrate and go out the urine. That's the renal threshold. Vitamins, particularly water-soluble vitamins, have very low renal thresholds. For example, if anyone's experienced taking um, you know, like you're taking a multivitamin and then like you go pee the after like a couple hours afterwards and it's like fluorescent. Those are your B vitamins. So, you know, some people are like, why well, bother taking vitamins? I mean, goodness, you just peeing it out. And then you can look at them and go, well, why bother drinking water? You're just peeing that out too. But, you know, the vitamins that you pee out, yeah, that is probably a waste. Not probably it is a waste because the content of your vitamin pill was higher than your kidneys can handle. You are peeing just that out. So sometimes when we're shopping for vitamins, you're looking at the label, kind of going, oh, I'm picking this one because it's got more, you know, because we're all about more is better. But really, it just means more to pee out. So the better vitamins, although a complete pain in the neck, which is why I don't take my vitamins very often, is smaller doses in a single pill because what you take in, you'll actually use and not pee out as much. So the quality vitamins tend to be, here you go, take it three to six times a day. And you're like, who does that? But 
Anyways, that is the ideal way to maximally absorb. So when you're looking at your centrum, you're like, I'm taking one of those. That's everything for the day. You're really not getting the full benefit because of that, because the renal thresholds are low. So this point here is less about taking vitamins, but more about different things have different renal thresholds. And glucose, that is one of them. So when you know there's glucose in the urine, you definitely have exceeded this renal threshold. That's the amount, the limit to what you're gonna send back, what you're going to reabsorb back into the blood. So the lupa henley is going to be our, we have that. What's happening is in the lupa henley, we actually cross over into, generally across here, we would have cortex, and the lupa henley is gonna dip down into the medulla actually the pyramid. So, so you can still have a perspective of your gross anatomy. But the thing here about the thick and thin side, the thin side is going to have little simple squamous epithelial tissues. What are squamous epithelial tissues good for? Simple squamous tissue for, and I'm gonna put in caps here just so it's different, diffusion. Remember just even the alveoli, diffusion of gases. We want as thin as possible. The thick side is thick because it's cuboidal. We pump, we do pumping, we transport. We do things like that. So this over here is going to be simple cuboidal, simple cuboidal epithelial tissue and its job is pumping. So this is what's going on. We have, and it's a little confusing at first because you have to start with the farther side. What's happening is the pumps on the ascending limb, because it's the going up side, is going to pump out, we're going to pump sodium. So we are pumping sodium out of the filtrate. And so the U-shaped curve here has a purpose. The fact that we're U-shaped is we are hyper concentrating sodium inside this hairpin turn. When we hyper concentrate sodium, what's water want to do? It wants to follow it. But because we have this easy side for diffusion, this is where any new water, and I'll just draw water as the dots, is going to want to come out, extra come out because it's so concentrated there. So it's a way for us to suck even more water out of the filtrate rather than just straight across here. It's way more effective because we've hyper-concentrated this in here. So this is how the loop of Henley's job is primarily reabsorption of water. It does it by tricking it with sodium, but its job and the goal is just water reabsorption. And the loop, helps it make that happen. You're gonna need to know the descending limb is simple squamous epithelial tissue, ideal for diffusion of water. The ascending limb going up is gonna be made of simple cuboidal epithelial tissue, pumping of sodium into the U of the lupa henley. That's gonna be what's gonna draw the water out off of the thin segment. That's this countercurrent multiplication. I do not have you know the countercurrent multiplication. You just can read the words here the, what the ascending limb and the descending limb. But it's how it's done. There's a very quantitative numeric value that's actually doing this, but I don't have you know that. Distal convoluted tubule. Get this cortex here out of the way. Distal is out here. Its main job is also up in the renal cortex. This has got simple, it's got without microvilli because we don't need the surface area. And I told you that it does two things, but I only told you one of the things last time. 
when we have our distal convoluted tubule, I told you that it does secretion. It goes from the blood to the tubule. So it's extra waste, bigger waste chunks come out here. But the number two thing, so I'll say this is number one for the distal convoluted tubule. Number two is going to be respond to hormones. Respond to the hormones, aldosterone, antidiuretic hormone, and atrial natriuretic peptide. These are going to raise blood pressure. This one's going to drop blood pressure. So we'll stop.